I think I'm gonna start a band The Great Depression is at hand People will moan across the land Yeah, I'm gonna start a band Or maybe I should write a book 1995 started off with a bang and became the tentpole year for Swedish indie pop. Many of the scene's stalwarts were releasing new material, and Brainpool would be leading the proverbial charge. Brainpool had recently finished a supporting role on Roxette's European tour, a move that singer Yanni Kask later admitted strained the act's indie credibility. But now they were back with their second album, Painkiller, and the highly anticipated release did not disappoint, as it featured a few surprises, was critically acclaimed, and won many of the indie crowd back over. The album earned a trio of nominations at the 1996 Swedish Grammy Awards as Brainpool were now the most argued about pop act in Sweden. Also grabbing their fair share of headlines were the Cardigans, who had just been signed by small U.S. label Minty Fresh, based out of Chicago. Their second album, Life, was released early in the year in Europe and became their American debut. And things went well. Very well. The breezy vibe of Carnival struck a chord in America, delighting their label, which began investing even more time and money into the act. I think the Americans actually get the music. They understand it the best, I think. We did a tour there, and that was probably the best tour we ever did. But their newfound American acclaim was nothing compared to what was happening across the Pacific, where Carnival was absolutely monstrous in Japan. The album went double platinum there, selling over half a million units. And soon other fellow Swedes would be reaping the benefits of this newfound attention, as 1995 became the year when Swedish indie pop erupted in Japan. The audience there had now been tempted by the likes of Eggstone and the Cardigans, and they wanted more. Luckily for them, a slew of acts were rising up the indie ranks in Sweden, and three in particular were about to strike Japanese gold. Welcome to visit our battlefield, it's Batman and Robin versus me. Put your feet, there's the U.S. fleet up ahead. 
dress is floating in my bed. Oh no! The trampolines jumped into the movement when Pear Davidson teamed up with Johann Stentrop. Their chemistry was obvious from the get-go, and although their debut album Splash didn't make much of a dent in Sweden, in Japan they were adored, as Splash became a gold record there. So recording a follow-up was a no-brainer. Trampoline's success in Japan did lead to a third and final album, and although How Do We Do didn't sell as many tickets as its predecessors, it was a satisfying ending indeed, to the slickest sounding trilogy of the indie pop movement. Cloudberry Jam formed within student circles in the early 90s, and by mid-decade they started making a name for themselves, releasing an EP and album on indie label North of No South Records. Soon thereafter, a new audience discovered Cloudberry Jam when their debut EP rolled out in Japan. Produced by Tori Johansson at Tambourine Studios, Elevator became a radio hit and within a month sold 50,000 copies. And the band would get even bigger when the poppier full length providing the atmosphere surpassed the 100,000 sales plateau in Japan, becoming certified gold. What am I waiting for? The moment silence can be heard. Maybe it's your turn. Unfortunately, when the band returned the following year, they suffered a major setback. The new record had a rock and funk bass sound, and many fans hated it. An overnight interest in them began to wane. Vocalist Jenny Medune was now burnt out, so she left the music world behind to re-enter the academic world. However, seven years later, three members would relaunch Cloudberry Jam as they would continue to make music while also reclaiming many of their original fans in the process. As Japan was enjoying its love affair with Swedish indie pop, the Merrymakers would not be left out, as they too would be the recipients of a gold record. It's very far away between Sweden and Japan, but in musical taste we seem to be very close, and, and that's nice for, for Swedish bands because Japan is such a big market compared to Sweden, so it, in a way it saves a lot of good music. Two years earlier, the Merrymakers were dropped from the Stockholm Records roster, so that label could concentrate on a newer, younger group, who oddly enough turned out to be the Cardigans. But now signed to CNR Music, the Merrymakers were back, 
With a new band member, new dynamic, and a batch of songs that would wake up ears in the East and in the West. In Japan, the Merrymakers became small sensations. And then suddenly a fan contacted them, suggesting they work together. And not just any fan. It was power pop icon Andy Sturmer of Jellyfish, one of their major recent influences. Um, we've heard that um, Andy Sturmer might be pro is producing your second album, is that true? Yeah, that's true. Jellyfish was a short-lived act out of San Francisco in the early 90s that couldn't quite break through to the mainstream. Although the band had some minor hits on the radio and MTV, leader Andy Sturmer disbanded Jellyfish after just two albums, disappointed by their lack of commercial success. Sturmer never formed another band, but in those years since, Jellyfish have earned a legendary cult status. We got an email from him, and he had seen our homepage on the internet. We couldn't believe it was really him, but um, it was. He was aware of the Merrymakers since Jellyfish played in Sweden in 93 and he had actually heard a single of ours <clears throat> which his mother liked even more than Jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> Back in Skellefta, the summer of 95 was warm and sunny. But it wasn't the Wanna Dies or This Perfect Day getting all the headlines. There was a new local band on the prowl that would become the scene's Batman in a way. By day, there were Swedish language popsters Hardy Nilsson. But at night, they sang in English, becoming their alter ego, Tommy 16. Hardy Nilsson was your typical garage band, before honing their skills and signing to a West Side fabrication. And national radio paid attention right away. As for Tommy 16, what started off as a side project quickly turned into something more, with the release of the song Number One Single, which became a college radio hit. Don't you know, though I was just a boy, I would give my life for you. Now with two record deals, the boys ended up releasing five albums in five years between the two personas. And soon thereafter, both Hardy Nilsson and Tommy 16 retired, after a very prolific and probably tiring run. The biggest underground band, if the scene even had one, was to be Broder Daniel, who had a punk energy fused with bits of glam rock to create their own unique brand of disheveled pop music.
After their first album was unleashed, a groundswell of support began to build, as pop fans who considered the indie pop scene a bit soft now had somewhere to go. In 1997, Broder Daniel would resign from their label and became free agents. But even though they had a huge live following, their niche audience and limited international possibilities kept the majors away. So one of the biggest acts in the country at the time found themselves with no label at all. By far the scene's most unpredictable band was the Confusions. Throughout their career, which continues to this day, they veered into many musical directions. When the indie scene went one way, the confusions would go the other, always keeping their listeners confused, thus the band's name. Over their first few EPs, the act gained some notoriety with the track, All Dressed Up. Well, I'm all dressed up In disbelief Am I a loveless one that doesn't dare to reach? Cause in your eyes, in your eyes, I see myself. I'm brown as they are, take me so far off, you and your brown eyes. With the confusions now on the radar, they released their debut album, Being Young which was produced by young studio whiz Arvid Lind and featured the single At the Brick House. The Confusions would soon be returning with an odd batch of songs that would bring them even further into the spotlight. Not returning, however, would be the producer, Arvid Lind, who'd just taken up a new gig as the newest member of Popsicle. Bassist Kenneth Wickstrom had left the band, so Lind answered the call, as the act began recording their third full length, a softer, self-titled affair. I'm trying to make this the last one you'll ever Just get it over with, you know it ain't true Sure wish I had the priorities here and now But I don't I just talk without thinking And I wonder Do you remember When it was good for that The album hurled Popsicle back into the mainstream top 10, right between Oasis and Ace of Bass. Now having conquered Sweden, Popsicle attempted to enter the British marketplace, spending much of the next year touring the UK extensively, drumming up publicity for a song that had become their biggest selling single ever back home. They're not forever! I can't change 
wish I'm not the same, not forever. But getting press outside of Scandinavia proved difficult, as the songs just weren't translating. The British press had dubbed Popsicle Sound Swindy, short for Swedish Indie, but to no commercial avail. So the group returned home, just in time to pick up their second Swedish Grammy, and this time without controversy. Of all the scene's marquee bands, 1995 was the roughest on this perfect day, who had now toughened up their sound perhaps hoping to prick up the ears of the British labels, as the boys turn the amps all the way up to 11. It's a shame underwhelmed, and when the full length came out, it debuted at number 41, but once the public heard its heavy-handed nature, it steadily disappeared from the radar. As for their UK desires, few even took a second notice of them. It would now take a bit of magic to get the band back on top. Fortunately, This Perfect Day still had something up their sleeves. 1996 would be the movement's most indulgent year with even more new talent rising above the fray. As for the Cardigans, it would be absolutely incredible. My uh, next guest tonight began performing together four years ago in their native Sweden, and they're with us tonight to perform the hit single from their album, First Band on the Moon. Please welcome the Cardigans. <laughs> First Band on the Moon, tell me a bit about where you picked that as an album title, because I always thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> like uh, space, yeah. space uh, uh, center, something like uh, NASA or something, you know, if they decide to send a band to the moon, you know, we probably have a good chance. Just like Santa Claus, the Cardigans were making stops seemingly everywhere to promote the new record. Here they are, kids. The Cardigans. The Cardigans. The Cardigans. The Cardigans. Please, Mike, welcome the Cardigans. <laughs> Tony, what are you gonna try to 
1996 års vinnare i kategorin pop rock grupp är The Cardigans. Aha! Vilken wow. överraskning. <laughs> Tack så hemskt mycket. Tack så mycket. Ja, It was a record-breaking year for the Cardigans. Not only was Love Fool one of the most memorable songs of 96, but its journey culminated with the inclusion to the aforementioned Romeo and Juliet soundtrack, right alongside You and Me song, which had now opened up new avenues for the Wanna Dies in America. The soundtrack was also the likely starting point of a media-created competition between the two bands, one that would last for years. And fortunately for music fans, both groups would be bringing out the big guns for their next efforts. And at stake, the title of Sweden's most successful indie band.